Skeptics Guide to uh, Emergency Medicine podcast. Uh, I don't know, is it just you, Ken, or are you, is there a group of you? Am I doing people out of a reputation? He doesn't care. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's definitely not the Skeptics Guide, which is my podcast, which used to take my audience wrong, but never mind. Uh, he's an EBM, evidence based medicine guru, uh, and his specialty in translational sort of information and how we understand what we're doing here is world renowned. He also uh, drinks maple whiskey, which I can't really recommend. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good at the time, but if it just wears Larry, that's what it does to you. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a, I know he's, he's an endurance athlete as well, so when we talk about the uh, common time, but he's uh, certainly an endurance athlete to drink maple whiskey. Well, thanks very much for coming, Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and I uh, really appreciate being invited uh, to come here. When I first arrived on Friday night, I was like, the cab driver couldn't find this place because he was like, I know there's supposed to be a hotel here somewhere, but it's like the secret society. <laughs> but from a membership standpoint, it shouldn't be a secret society. Everybody should know about this, and I would encourage you to get involved because it's just fantastic. This facility here is beautiful, and I had a chance to wander through the library and go, ooh. <laughs> um, but I'm going to be talking about the knowledge gap. So the title of the presentation is Mind the KT or Mind the Knowledge Gap. And the focus was supposed to be on learning in the 21st century. You don't need to write anything down. Everything is going to be available because this is live stream. So if you want to say anything, it is being recorded. So I want to let you know that. But also I want to encourage you to tweet uh, any of the slides out or any of the information out so those of us who can't be in the room today can also learn from today's presentation. There are three things that I'm going to ask you to remember from today's presentation and I'll ask you at the end of the presentation to see if I was successful in doing knowledge translation. So are you ready for the three things? <clears throat> Number one, it takes 10 years, more than 10 years for high quality, clinically relevant information to reach the bedside. So that's the first thing, there is a knowledge gap. The first thing is there is a knowledge gap and it's more than 10 years. The second thing that I want you to remember is don't panic. Okay, don't panic. Critical appraisal can be fun and we will be showing a demonstration of how fun it can be. And I wanna thank in advance the volunteers who have of course generously, yes, I'm looking at you. Um, offered to come up and assist me, so it's not always me giving the presentation. And that's the second thing, okay? So you can do critical appraisal and it can be fun. Critically appraising the literature is a blast. And then the final thing, the third thing, of course, is it is the skeptics guide, so I wanna encourage you to be skeptical of anything you learn, even if I taught you today. So we're gonna start with this KT gap, and this is, this is a wonderful illustration of the knowledge translation gap. And this was put forward by Pathman, and it's called the leaky pipe model. So the top of that slide is there is this reservoir of high quality, clinically relevant information. And at the bottom is the patient and at the bedside. And there are these seven leaks along the way that prevent high quality, clinically relevant information from reaching the patient's bedside. And the first leak is awareness. Someone else who had some maple whiskey last night. <laughs> Yes, well, you do. You, you, I wouldn't want to admit to blacking out, but okay. Um, uh, well, I don't know well enough to bug them. Um, uh, so the, the, that first leak there at the top, right under that, is if you're not aware of the information, how can you possibly act upon the information? So awareness, and this is one of the ways that social media can really impact this by raising awareness, by live streaming, by tweeting, by sharing the information. Now, I've said it's 10 years, because that's the first thing I want you to remember, spaced repetition. The first thing is 10 years, right? But the actual quoted number is 17 years for 14% of the information to reach the patient's bedside. That's how long it takes now, 17 years, of trying to put precision on something. So I always say it takes more than 10 years, and not for all the information, for 14% of the information. And there are great examples of that. I mean, I still have trainees who say, <gasps> Dr. Milne, you can't put epinephrine in the tip of anything. It'll fall off. No, it won't. Or how about uh, TPA is a powerful and effective treatment for stroke. <laughs> Antipyretics prevent febrile seizures. <laughs> and topical anesthetics for simple corneal abrasions? Oh, you'll go blind. <laughs> so, there is a knowledge gap. So social media is what I'm offering up as a solution. 
social media like blogs, podcasts, things that I'm doing with YouTube and Instagram, and it can cut that KT window down from over 10 years, remember that's the first thing, to less than one year using the power of social media. And so we're going to do a critical appraisal. We are going to look at the literature. And it's the plan for the 30 minutes that I have, because I just wanted to give a little intro. The plan for that 30 minutes is teach you how to do critical appraisal of a randomized control trial. How to look at the literature skeptically. I see the faces around the room. It's like, oh, critical appraisal. What is this, journal club? I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> oh, the pain in the eyes, yes. Um, but I want to demonstrate the second point. And the second point is this can be fun. I brought things to make it fun. And I'm going to have an assistant to help me. So, Christy, could you come up? Now, uh, this is Dr. Chalen. And Dr. Chalen uh, helps me doing paper and a pick. So that's paper and a picture. And so I've got her some swag with her very own branded paper and a picture jacket. Yes, very nice. I love the lighting. Thank you. All right, and we're going to demonstrate that second point, that it can be fun to do critical appraisal. I need two volunteers, so thank you very much for offering. <laughs> I, like, we went through this, didn't we? Ten minutes ago. All right, so while they're making their way up, and Christy will get them uh, uh, organized there and uh, appropriately uh, costumed and draped. Um, you may be familiar with Marshall McLuhan, he's a Canadian uh, from the University of Toronto who had this famous saying, the medium is the message. And so today I'm live streaming this or cheating it, I'm talking about social media, that's the second point of social media. You know, you can use that to make things fun and exciting for even critical appraisal. So critical appraisal can be fun and exciting, but that's not my famous, that's not my favorite quote by him. Here's my favorite quote by him. I love this quote. Because anybody who tries to make that distinction doesn't know that anything, right? It has to be fun or you won't engage, you won't remember. And I want to make sure that you remember, I went to that RSM presentation and they did something really weird. You need their names on them too, right? Oh, you're getting their names, okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a cooking show. I am gonna present you a Gord Ramsey kind of cooking show. So uh, my jacket is there, I'm gonna get my hat on. You will remember this. <laughs> Critical appraisal. So I gotta get, now I promise I'm Canadian, so I'm not gonna yell at people like Gord Ramsey and call them a stupid sandwich or anything like that. But when it comes to critical appraisal, there I'm probably oh, oh, and would you like to introduce our guests? So, Sarah? Yeah. Sarah? So, like, yeah, what? You're probably making notebook people. Okay, yes. And so what we're <laughs> going to do is, in a critical appraisal, right, when you're doing a critical appraisal, a lot of it is about the methods and how good are the methods. And it's sort of like making a good apple pie. I actually grew up on an apple farm. So making a good apple pie all comes down to wonderful, healthy, super uh, ingredients. And if you're going to do a good randomized control trial, you need great methods, all right? And if you have great methods, you are going to make a wonderful apple pie. That's Sarah, right? So she's got the one that says apple pie. Now, I, like I said, I grew up on a farm. If you put in terrible methods, terrible ingredients, what you end up with, and I don't know if this translates, but a cow pie. Because I grew up on a farm, like I said, and you would find these things about this big, and it came out of a cow, and it looked like a pie. Now, it might be a pie, but it's not very tasty. Okay? So, uh, to do this, you have a quality checklist to go through. So, we are going to go through the recipe to make a good pie, or in this case, a good randomized control trial. And there are various checklists. Again, you don't need to remember this. You can take a picture of it. It's being recorded, so you can watch it on the Facebook page. But the SGEM has these checklists under Make It So, and so for randomized control trials, observational studies, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, and all the different subtypes of those, the quality checklists are there to probe the literature for its validity. So let's go through the ingredients. Our first ingredient is you got to have the right patients. So um, to the, that's the foundation of a good study, and so um, you're going to be the cow pie over here, Okay, so you need four bowls. That's the foundation, okay, is the pie crust. You need a good foundation. You need to make sure you're getting the right patient. So I'd like you to set up four pies that you're going to be making. And then, of course, for our wonderful apple pie, we have edible waffle cones. Oh, I ate one the other night when I just got in. I was like so hungry. 
Um, so we're going to have uh, edible waffle cones. And that's the foundation, right? The foundation of a good study is to make sure that you are getting the right patients. It's no use having all the other methods if you're investigating a patient population that you don't see in the emergency department. If you're doing a study on heart attacks, right, and you're doing it on 18-year-olds, you might be missing a significant part of this uh, population that is involved in heart attacks. So you need the right patient population. Now the next thing, it, you know, to do a quality assessment on a randomized control trial is randomization. It's right there. It's the first thing in the name. So randomization is a very important. So in this case, you need high quality randomization. So we have two sets of apples. We have a bunch of rotten apples for the cow pie that I sliced up last night that are sort of going bad and brown and yucky. And then we have some fresh apples that we're going to slice up and put each into the pie with Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. She didn't know that she was going to get more of the work. Whereas you're, you're going to distribute the apples into each of those because you're going to make four pies. All right, now randomization is so very important. And it's a way to minimize bias. And when I say bias, I don't mean random error. I mean something that systematically moves us away from the truth. Right? So that's what bias means. And randomization, you want to make sure that it's adequate and it's concealed. You can do one-to-one. -one. Okay, you're in your, you know, one, two, one, two, one, two. You can do block randomization, right? You can do cluster randomization. There's all sorts of ways to randomize. But if you don't randomize well, you end up with rotten apples as the basis of your pie. And to illustrate that, I thought I'd bring up a Scottish physician. He was a medical student at the time. We have registrars here or trainees, do we? Anybody? Oh, yeah, oh, of course, yeah. yeah, we met earlier. Aren't you glad you dodged this bullet? Yeah. <laughs> so I said, well, maybe if the attendees don't want to do it, you must have residents to volunteer or told. Yeah, and so this was a medical student, by the way, Alexander Hamilton, not the one on Broadway, different Alexander Hamilton. And Alexander Hamilton was working in the Peninsula Wars as a medical student, a Scottish medical student, and they were experiencing camp fever. Now, I, I told the uh, resident that there wouldn't be any hard questions, but I'll throw one question out to you. All right, in the current sepsis guidelines, is it recommended that you bloodlet, take away fluid? Is that a core concept of sepsis treatment, no. taking away fluid? Well, I mean, I mean they're, they're so far on the other side of 30 cc's per kilogram, but that's not what this talk is about. Okay, so he said, listen, I don't, he was a skeptic. Well, that's a skeptic, point number three. I don't think bloodletting is such a great idea for these people with camp fever. But the standard of the day was the evil humors, and we must remove that one evil humor. And if the patient dies, there can all these rationalizations go on saying, oh, clearly you didn't bleed them enough. We didn't get them soon enough. We didn't bleed them long enough. We didn't do it on the dominant arm instead of the non-dominant arm. All these rationalizations. So he set up a randomized trial. So this was the first randomized trial to emphasize how important starting with good ingredients for an apple pie is, rotten apples versus bad apples, or good apples. And so he were randomized, and you can create a two-by-two two table from his dissertation from 1806 or 1809. You can create a two-by-two two table. So which group do you want to be in? If you got bloodlet, 90, 29% died. That's standard of care, by the way. Okay, you're getting standard of care. Standard of care just means that's what the standard is. Doesn't mean that's what you should do. All right? And then no blooding, 3% died. So an absolute risk reduction of 26%. Number needed to kill or harm was four. Randomization is very important in a randomized control trial, starting with good apples. All right, let's move on to something quick. Okay, you need a little sugar. You need to you know, add some sweetness to this pie. And so um, you, you can have regular sugar, which is great. Sprinkle a little sugar on each of the pie. Or you can get something sweet, and it's called artificial sweetener. Uh, not maybe as tasty, yeah. Now, um, this is about consecutive patients. So a sweet way to do a randomized control trial is make sure every single patient that comes through the door is eligible for the trial. You can't pick and choose, right? You've got to have a sweet, sweet ingredients to make a great apple pie. Otherwise, you end up with this, ugh. I don't know if people use that in their coffee or whatever it is. So you can't pick and choose. And a lot of randomized trials, you'll see a convenient sample, convenient sample. And what that means is when the research staff was available, usually, right? Monday to Friday, 8 to 4, 9 to 5, something like that. Who here does emergency medicine? Oh, I do. Yeah. Who here thinks people that come at nights, weekends, and holidays are a little different? 
than some of the people that present at 10 a.m. Okay, you know, the, the 2 a.m. on a Saturday night, people might be a different patient population. So you need consecutive patients. That's the sweet ingredient, the second thing to make a great apple pie. Next thing you do is you have to make sure that both are similar. So um, some people like a little cinnamon in their apple pie. So we have cinnamon to place in each of the pie to give that apple cinnamon flavor. It goes together so well. Now we have cumin. And cumin, it, it's brown, <laughs> it's a spice, it looks like cinnamon, cinnamon, it may seem similar, but it's not similar. So a little cumin on each of those rotten apples. And this is time to explain that you need, um, people have that get randomized, the consecutive patients that come into the trial, they need to have baseline characteristics that are similar for prognostic factors, right? So if you have one group, just by mere chance, or selection bias, okay, mere chance or selection bias, maybe they have a history of diabetes, they've had three stents, they're 80 years old, and the other group has no diabetes, no hypertension, don't smoke, right? Then you're not comparing two similar groups. You don't have cinnamon and cinnamon, you have cinnamon and cumin, or in this case, you have apples and oranges. So another key point to evaluating a good quality randomized control trial is you need similar patient populations a priori after randomization. All right, and then here's another key concept, and this is blinding. This is the salt, okay? And so we have a little salt to put in, because you need a little salt, you've got the sweetness, now you need a little salt in the pie, and so we have good salt that you're gonna grind up fresh, okay, grind up fresh, and then we have garlic salt. Oh. Okay, and so this is all about blinding, and so they may look the same. I could show you those things, and you could go like this. And the thing, the study, would be unblinded. Right? And there's a huge placebo effect potential in studies. And so if you can unblind a study, you can bias the study. Oh, I was in the treatment group. Yes, my stroke is a lot better. I was in the placebo group. Oh, sorry about that. How's your stroke? Oh, I didn't turn out very well. Right? On a subjective self-assessment score. And so you need to make sure that blinding is maintained. And so I have a, the first blinding trial. And this is actually where we got the term blinding. Sarah, are you ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> she looks so nervous. Doesn't she look great? I hope you're taking pictures of them in your classroom. <laughs> so, so blinding. This is, this is Franz Mesmer. I know you know this story. This is Franz Mesmer, a famous German sir, uh, uh, physician who worked in France. And so he had this um, idea that magnets could cure disease and illness because animal magnetism was something that was being recognized. This is 200 years ago, I'm not being judgmental. It's like bloodletting. That was the best information they had at the time. And magnetism was the big deal. And so they had Marie Antoinette, and she was his patron. And she spent a lot of time and money on Mesmer for these various magnetic therapies, okay? Where they would put magnets and then um, do this sort of stuff. And, you know, I, I don't want to use the term, but anyways, and, and people would feel better, right? And so it got so popular, they put a big bowl around a banquet table, so they call it a banquet, and a big bowl full of magnets, and people would hold metal rods, and then this would happen, and they would feel better, right? And so the King Louis the Sixteenth wasn't too pleased with this, because Marie Antoinette was spending so much time with Mesmer, and so she, uh, or sorry, he um, got an expert, and put a royal commission together that involved Benjamin Franklin. So he steamed over from the States and did a trial. And what they did was they tested the patients with the magnets and without the magnets present. But the way they had to do that to make sure that there was no bias was they put blindfolds around them. And so they blinded the study. And this is where we get the term blinding. And blinding is so very important. So when you say you've got a blinded study, it all came from blindfolds. Now, this is a triple-blinded study if Mesmer didn't know, if the Marie Antoinette didn't know, and then the outcome assessor, Benjamin Franklin, didn't know. That would be a triple-blinded study. This was only single-blinded. Only the patient was unaware of whether or not the magnets were there or not. But you can get a triple-blinded study, and that would be the best. Now, are you ready, Sarah? This is the big question. What was the conclusion that Benjamin Franklin had about Franz Mesmer's magnetic therapy? Was there anything to it? <laughs> oh, you do, and I know you do. You ready? There was nothing to it. They were just being. <laughs> and hopefully this presentation, right, 
about social media, how you can use social media and storytelling and sending it out electronically and talking about critical appraisal to make it fun. That's point number two, remember? All right, so we're talking about blinding, so let's make sure that we're treating both groups equally. And that's why we've got Justice, Lady Justice there, because she's blindfolded, right? So that's the segue there. And so this will be cream. I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. And so I went over to your local grocery store, local grocery store, is palatial, sort of, hey, what's it called, John something? John Lewis. John Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most expensive kind of ice cream I've ever bought, people. <laughs> Because I bought it last night for this, and there, there's these little fridges in, uh, in the RSM, in the, in the rooms, but um, I thought they'd have a little freezer sort of, and they don't. So when I woke up this morning, the ice cream was all melted in the refrigerator, so I had to run across this morning for this to get a fresh pint of ice cream. So vanilla ice cream. So we're going to put a scoop of vanilla ice cream. Now, um, uh, in comparison, uh, you know, ice cream, fantastic vanilla ice cream, um, lard. So uh, unfortunately for the rotten pie, it's going to get lard. And that's meaning that you didn't treat each group equally. So he's going to cut out and scoop out some lard onto each pie. They look similar. They're both white substances, but not as tasty in a pie. And the thing with uh, this is that you need to make sure that both groups were treated equally, except for the intervention. So if you were going to give a drug to these two groups, one gets the drug and one gets the placebo, in this case, you want to make sure that nothing else is done so that the treatment group didn't get more attention, didn't get other things added onto it. Because if it is, you don't know, is it a drug, the treatment that's making the impact, or is it something else that was done with it? So you need to treat both groups equally. The pies are coming along so, so far so good? Looking good. Looking good, okay. All right, so you need to treat both groups equally. So when you're doing a critical appraisal of a randomized control trial, make sure that they say both groups were balanced coming in and that the only difference between the two groups was the treatment or the intervention that was being done. And then you need good follow-up. And so for follow-up, I'm speaking of cream. And so you need a little whipped cream. So that's the can of whipped cream. So we've got some whipped cream for the apple pie, and we have, unfortunately, sour cream. Poor follow-up for the uh, cow pie. And so uh, we're going to scoop some of those. So this is a quality indicator for a randomized control trial. And we look for 80% following up. At least, oh, she's going to have fun with that, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, don't, I'm just waiting for her to put it in her mouth and just go. <laughs> so it's not noon, okay? It's too early in the day. So, um, so follow-up is really important. So we look for 80%. So if you lose 20% or more to follow-up, we're like, yeah. I would add to that that if your effect size, the effect that you showed, the difference between treatment and placebo or treatment and control, is less than the number of people you lost to follow-up, I'd be very skeptical about that. Let's say you lost only 5%. What happens if 15% were in the uh, placebo group, right, and 3% were in the treatment group? Why, why were there so many more people that didn't finish the study, or you couldn't follow up? Were they dead? Did they go missing? Did they drop out? What was the reason, right? And if that effect size is less than the follow-up, I'm also worried that the people that didn't follow up could all have been in the negative or the null, right? And so that would outweigh the difference that you observe. So look for follow-up and look for a high number of follow-up and that the follow-up, the loss of follow-up is less than the effect size as another quality indicator. All right, and then we're going to get into, um, this is intention to treat versus per protocol. Some people like a little cheese with their pie, a little nippy cheese. Now, there's different types of cheese. Some people like cheddar cheese. Some like this moldy cheese. Some like this other cheese with red stuff in it. So I'm not going to make any judgments about cheese. Everybody has different cheeses. So this is the thing about ITT, intention to treat analysis and per protocol. It's like cheese. It all depends what you like. So... In a randomized control trial, right, we usually look for, hey, was that an intention to treat analysis? So what that means is that once you've done randomization, those people are randomized into control or treatment. You analyze the people, regardless of what happened. Because sometimes people drop out, some people switch teams, right? But you want to analyze them to immediately after randomization. That's called intention to treat. I had an intention to treat you. That is a quality indicator in a superiority trial to see if one treatment is it superior to control or placebo. And that's because when you have that sort of crossover and fuzziness, right, it decreases the effect size, so it's a more conservative way to look at the literature, 
right? And you're less likely to reject the null hypothesis because of bias. I know that's getting a little nerdy, but here's the key. So it's more conservative. However, some people like other cheese, if you have a non-inferiority study, don't look for an intention to treat analysis. You want a per protocol analysis. You want to see what the treatment effect was. You want to see that the treatment effect was as wide as possible by looking at who actually got the treatment and didn't get the treatment. And that way, for a non-inferiority, you're stretching those two points apart because you want to be very conservative to say, is this non-inferior or not? So a superior trial, you want intention to treat to try to keep those point estimates close. A non-inferiority trial, you're looking for a per-protocol analysis. And I just reviewed a paper just this week doing that and where they did a non-inferiority study. And what did they do? An intention to treat analysis. And that biases you away from the truth. All right, so now we're going to go look at poos, do's, moos, and loos. All right, now so we have some sauces to drizzle on our pies. And so we have caramel sauce for the apple pie, a little caramel sauce to drizzle on the apple pie. And this makes sense because we're talking about cows and stuff. We have barbecue sauce to drizzle on the cow pie. And this is talking about poos, do's, loos, and moos. Poos are patient-oriented outcomes. We want to see that this is a clinically relevant patient-oriented outcome for the patient. Right? Because we often see doo doo, okay? Poopy outcomes. Right? That's disease oriented outcomes. And a disease oriented outcome would be like a change in blood pressure. So we did an intervention, we gave a medicine, and the blood pressure went down three millimeters of mercury, and that was statistically significant. Did the patient know that? Did they feel that? Did they have an MI? Did they have a stroke? Was there any negative consequences? Did they go into renal failure? Did anything happen? No, they have no idea. But three millimeters was statistically significant not clinically significant, and a disease-oriented outcome, not a patient-oriented outcome. Now, a loo is also a surrogate disease sort of oriented outcome. That's looking at what was their sugar level in the ICU? How did their lactate change with septic management? All right? A lactate with sepsis would be a lab-oriented outcome. We're following the labs. Who, who here treats labs? I treat patients. Right? So we want to see patient-oriented outcome. Now, being a country boy, I am trying to coin this new term called a moo. Do I have a sound file? No, uh, it didn't come through. So I do have a moo. And a moo is a monitored-oriented outcome. And I see this again with sepsis. So you've got a septic patient. They're in the ICU, and the alarms are going off. So what do we do? We can't have the alarms going off, you know, because the nurse is going to come and say, the alarms are going off. We set the parameter for systolic at 90, and this per person's blood pressure is 85. So what do we do? We give them vasopressors, right? And now the systolic blood pressure is 95. Great. The alarms aren't going off. The nurse isn't upset, and the nurse isn't coming to me to say the alarms are going off. Everybody's happy. Unfortunately, the data shows that those vasopressors doesn't make a clinically a patient-oriented outcome. How many people left the ICU alive or dead? No difference with those vasopressors. We don't have that data. We have monitored-oriented outcomes, surrogate outcomes, disease-oriented outcomes, but not patient-oriented outcomes. Like I left the ICU neurologically intact, a very important patient-oriented outcome. All right, and then the, the cherry on top, right? Are we up to the cherry on top? Oh, geez, did I skip the maple syrup? Mm, I might have, yeah. Oh, we're going to go to the cherry on top. Okay, so now we have the cherry on top on top of the uh, thing, and that is whether or not the effect size is large enough. So was it a big effect size? And is it precise enough to be clinically significant? So we have cherries, wonderful cherries, and we have cherry tomatoes. <laughs> so go on the other one, right? And so they seem the same, right? large and precise. Is it large enough and precise enough to be clinically meaningful to the patient? And is it precise? So large means how big the effect size was. So did you change something by 0.5%? This is what we see in statin literature sometimes to prevent a subsequent MI or something like that. You'll see this like, oh, it went from 2% and being on a statin for 10 years, and I'm just trying to remember this, will drop your reduction to 1.5%. So you get an absolute reduction of 0.5%. Is that clinically meaningful? Is that relevant? How many people do you have to treat? And how, do you, how, how long and how significant will that? And then the precision is that 95% confidence interval. So if you have narrow confidence intervals, you can be pretty sure about that. If it's wide, you're like, I don't know. Look at that. It goes from 1 to 100. 
<laughs> you know, and the point estimate is at 50. How precise is that? It's just basically a So you want to see that it's large and precise enough to be clinically relevant. And then at the end, maybe this is where we can add the maple syrup, because I forgot this. I did bring maple syrup and, and corn syrup. Is it corn syrup? No, it's date syrup or something. I couldn't find corn syrup in your grocery store. So we have 100% pure Canadian maple syrup. Well, it doesn't get better than this unless it's in whiskey. <laughs> Um, and that is not whiskey, by the way. Um, and, and then we have uh, date syrup and stuff like that. So you want to know, is this practice changing? Now I've done a quality checklist. I've gone through the 10 quality checklist items for a randomized control trial. Is this actually practice changing? It could be just practice affirming I'm doing the right thing. Or is it practice changing? And one way is to look at the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm and compare those two outcomes as clinically relevant and say, hmm, is this enough to move me into making a change in my practice? And at the end, then, um, you'll have a wonderful apple pie if you use high quality methods. And we do have some spoons, and, um, and yeah, we have a number of spoons, and if you want to take some pies out to the audience and ask them which pie they would like to sample, um, because if you have really good ingredients, high quality methods in a randomized control trial, you'll end up with this wonderful, tasty pie. If you have yucky, terrible ingredients in the pie or the randomized control trial, you will have a cow pie, and that's why I have the poop emoji. So, Hopefully, by showing you through this social event, because, I mean, I've been to many countries, and I'll have to tell you that most of the time, if you go to someone's uh, house for a house party, where does the party take place? In the kitchen. And so we wanted to go in the kitchen and show you, oh, no, please, yes, yeah, yeah. Did, 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 oh, did you take some? Yes, good, the Cuban's very good, isn't it? Um, uh, to make it fun and use social media to make it fun and make it into a social event and so that you could tweet it out to the world and we could be live streaming this. And we can raise awareness about how fun critical appraisal can be. Critical appraisal can be like making a great apple pie. And so looking through your next research paper, if you have to evaluate it, if you're looking at it, I want you to think of apple pie and I want to think, you to think of all the different ingredients we went through today so we can cut that knowledge translation gap from over 10 years to less than one year. So when good information is, oh, yeah, you got to give that to the president. He's getting a poop pie, isn't he? So let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this up for you. We've been talking about the literature, and one of the key concepts that I try to promote about evidence-based medicine is the myth-busting that evidence-based medicine is just about the literature. We've spent 30 minutes doing a critical appraisal about a randomized control trial, talking about the literature. Evidence-based medicine is not just about the literature. That's only one of three parts. The other important part is the clinician. The clinician has to use their judgment. The physician has to use their clinical experience to interpret the literature. So the literature informs our care, it guides our care, but it should never dictate our care. We still need to use this device. And then, of course, a very key component, the third component in evidence-based medicine, it's asking the patient, what do they value? What are their preferences? Because people are different, and we treat an N of one. And unless we ask them, because we don't treat a population, we treat an N of one in our uh, business, we've got to ask them what they would value and what they would prefer when the literature is informing our clinical judgment and engaging the patient. So that's just a one minute thing to say, listen, evidence-based medicine, I know this was 30 minute heavy on the literature, on making a pie and evaluating a pie. It's not just about the literature. It's about the clinician and about the patient. So I asked you to remember three things. I'm gonna finish on time, one minute left. So here are the three things that I asked you to remember. What was the first thing? 10 years, yes, the first thing is it can take over 10 years for high quality, clinically relevant information to reach the patient's bedside. Do you remember number two? Yes, it can be fun. Making pie is fun. Critical appraisal, I love critically appraising papers. I love going through that checklist and looking, did they have a good recipe? And does the recipe support their conclusions? And the final thing? Don't be skeptical. Yeah, don't trust me. Don't trust anybody, right? Just because something was published in a peer reviewed journal, it's a pie. We made a pie. Is it a good pie? I don't think so. Right? So if you see something that was published, you can't just read the abstract and go, yeah, well, this was published. 
Isn't that what the peer reviewers are supposed to do? Isn't that what the journal is supposed to do to make sure it's high quality? Not so much, right? You, it, just because it was published means it was published. It doesn't mean it's a good study and it doesn't mean it should change your practice. What makes it a good study are the ingredients that go into the recipe so that you get a lovely Sarah uh, apple pie. And sorry about this, but instead of a cat pie. So thank you very much. That's my presentation. for being involved in this, you can keep the aprons. <laughs> okay? Um, did you have uh, questions or anything like that? Or? Well, yeah, well, definitely the questions. Uh, that was, uh, I was kind of well, I was taking an educational risk by doing this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was definitely one of the best 40 minutes I've sat for Remember, this is being recorded. I'm going to buy reputation for swearing. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Steve. Hi, good. thanks for that. That's really good. Um, obviously, there's an importance for social media getting the message out as mm -hmm. good as possible. Where it's at, but we're actually kind of seeing a, a thing at the moment with the measles about some. How do you govern the social media? So, govern. So, yeah. How do you make sure that there isn't the faults? Yeah, you, sort of. yeah. You can't. Gut, once it's out there, it's very difficult to govern. And that's why um, I'm trying to promote uh, critical skill, critical thinking skills and skepticism. Um, just like when you pick up a journal or pick up a magazine or pick up a newspaper, um, looking at it with a skeptical eye is the best way um, to govern the information because the information will come. And uh, I, I relate it to this issue of quality. And we've had an issue with regards to quality in social media for 2,500 years. And so this is Socrates. And Socrates uh, was giving an, uh, it was told by Plato, but Socrates was complaining about the social media of the time. And the social media, he said, quote, it would weaken the mind. Social media will weaken the mind. You'll get forgetful learners, right? They won't remember anything. If it was worth remembering, you'd remember it. You wouldn't have to, like, look it up or write it down. And then you will trust external sources. So you'll listen to a blog or a podcast, exactly what you're saying. Exactly. Just like Socrates, you have the same complaints as one of the brightest minds in the world. Say, listen, you know, you're going to trust these, you know, this guy on a podcast, this guy from Canada with a microphone and a mouth, right? And, and you're going to appear, the, the, the student, the resident, will look like they know everything because they've got it in the tip of their hands. He was talking about paper. And we're talking about smartphones, podcasts, and blogs. And so these criticisms have been with every social media aspect, whether it was the printing press, whether it was radio. I grew up in the era of television, and my parents told me it was the idiot box and it would make me stupid. Right? So every generation has looked and said, the social media that we have right now, it's crap. What about the quality? Right? And what we need to do is empower ourselves and empower our trainees to be good, skeptical thinkers and critical thinkers. So how do you protect uh, against the Dr. Google of the world? <laughs> the Dr. Googles. Yeah, um, it's difficult. I, I mean, I want to empower patients, and I, I use it as a teachable moment. So when they come in with their Dr. Google uh, concerns, I'm the expert, and I can interpret it, and I engage them. And I, my usual sort of approach is to say, listen, you're an expert at you. Nobody knows you or your child better than you know you or your child. And I'm the expert at the medicine, and between the two of us, and I'm so encouraged that you've taken the time to do some research and look into this. Let me add to that, help you with that, and interpret that. But I don't think you can stop the internet. <laughs> Dr. Google will exist. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, fortunately. Whatever. It's a tool, right? And that's and everybody talks about social media, and I just, it's a tool. And just like any other tool, it can be used for great good or great evil. That's my, that's my doctor evil. I didn't go to evil medical school for six years to be called Mr. Very nice. So, um, you know, it's how we use it. And, and I would say, use it for joy, use it for goodness, use it for kindness and support and make the world a better place. And if you're using social media for that tool, then you'll have accomplished something. And that's what I'm trying to do with my social media project, The Skeptic's Guide, is I want patients to get the best care based on the best evidence. 
for no cost.